All right, so as we get cooking today, uh, I want to first lead you in a very simple meditation uh, that will help center us and ground us uh, as we go forward. And actually to help toward that, uh, you get to play with fire just a little bit. So if you will, uh, on your table, uh, light two purples and one pink. Uh, so do the end ones on both sides and then the, the pink one. Today's candle represents joy. So we've had hope, peace, and now joy today. If we were more on a liturgical bent at our church, um, we might not sing joy to the world, but joy to the world actually was an Advent proper song. And so we might have sung that today uh, if we were a liturgical church, <laughs> but, but we're not. <laughs> so we sort of uh, mishmash as much as we like. Now I'm going to see if this wants to play nice. All right. <laughs> I could tell somebody's not very quick on the light. <laughs> All right. We have really good insurance. So if any of you have trouble with that, we got you covered. Oh, good point, which makes the case for a mask. That's right. That's right. That's why we wear masks. <laughs> Very good. All right. It looks like everybody's uh, lit up pretty good. So uh, what I want you to do is this is a... Uh, a very simple prayer. Uh, it's a palms up, palms down, palms up meditation. So what you do is you start off in a comfortable position where you can breathe deeply with your palms down. Eventually, I'm going to have you put your palms up, but right now, just put your palms down I like this. And close your eyes and take a couple deep, slow, cleansing breaths just to kind of help you center down here today. And then there's one thing as you continue to breathe, I'm going to have you do with me. We'll do two of these. Uh, it's a particular kind of breathing exercise that taps one of your nerves that helps you uh, relax uh, more than just regular breathing. So you're going, to, you're going to take a slow breath in, like five to six counts. You're going to hold your breath for like four counts. Then you're going to release your breath slowly for another five or six counts. Okay? So let's breathe in. Hold it. And breathe out. Breathe in slow again. Hold it. Breathe out slow. With your palms down, this is a posture of letting go. So just take a moment as you continue to breathe in and out. Release uh, your cares to God. Release your physical pain to God if you have any today sitting in your chairs. Release whatever mental anguish you might be carrying in today, even if that anguish is, you know, who's going to win today's football game and are you going to get your Christmas task list done? It's a much more serious thing, of course. Release your emotions that you brought in with you today, both good and bad, so you can be fully present here with, together. And whatever else is on your heart, release them to God that you might be fully engaged here and now. I invite you to flip your hands over so your palms are facing up in your lap. This is a posture of receptivity. It is a way of being open to the moment, being open to the very Spirit of God who is here with us today. Make a conscious decision now to be intentional about listening 
for the still small voice of God. God, you were present in our lives before we were born. You've been with us every step of the way, even if we haven't recognized it. We cannot live apart from your presence, for you animate us. You are the life-giving presence in the entire universe, and you continue to create at an accelerating speed. You are here. You cannot not be here. May we have ears to hear, open minds, soft hearts, a willingness to see and discover more. For you long to help us see you more clearly. As was the tradition of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so as we get cooking uh, today uh, with uh, the teaching, uh, first, want to give you a little bit of disclaimer because I'm going to talk a little bit in some uh, ways that might make you uncomfortable. Uh, I always threaten to ruin Christmas this time of year, and I might today, uh, but I don't want to. Uh, but it could still happen, and want to just give you the freedom to relax and breathe. Uh, the things I'm going to share, some ways of thinking might be new to you, but they're not really new. They're actually very, very old, but they might be new and they might be startling. And so I just want to give you a heads up on that. And to kind of get there, to set the stage, I want to talk about the perennial tradition. The perennial tradition refers to something that we see in nature all the time. It's a, it's a process that happens continually over time. It's a process of life, death, and rebirth. It happens all the time. Uh, we see this happen every season. Uh, we're heading into the season of death and winter, but we know that's going to give way to spring with new life and into summer, continued life, and fall is going to come around, and that's the start of death again, and seeds are going to fall from trees into the ground, which are going to create new life, and the cycle continues and continues and continues. This is the way of the created order. This happens on a cellular level in your body. It's always happening. Whether or not you want it to, it's happening. <laughs> uh, you are a new creation uh, fairly regularly, even if you didn't know it. You are. That's how our bodies are designed. This process is everywhere. And it also uh, has to do with our thought. So that we might use different words for it. Uh, we've used words, fancy words, in the past couple of weeks, like the cataphatic and the apophatic <laughs> way of thinking. Hope you've been able to impress your friends with such fancy Greek words. The cataphatic represents those constructs, those images of God that uh, help us understand and have a relationship with the divine in some way. And sometimes, you know, they're the, the big bearded guy on a throne up in heaven somewhere. And sometimes faith is like a castle. You might remember some of those images from a video that I shared. Uh, that would be a representation of the cataphatic side. And the apophatic is just the opposite of that, where we recognize that no words can adequately describe uh, the fullness of God. Well, sometimes in our life, we get very comfortable, and those cataphatic images are incredibly helpful to us. Uh, we all need constructs in our lives. We need schema to help put the framework together so that we can navigate forward and know how we're even interacting uh, in whatever way. But over time, that construct that we have, uh, we notice that it doesn't quite deliver fully. And so we know that we need to deconstruct uh, some of that construction that has been so helpful. And after we go through a period of deconstruction, taking out some things that may no longer be helpful or relevant, we reconstruct with new things to help make sense of things given our learning and our experience, etc. So there's this process of construction, deconstruction, reconstruction. Inevitably, what happens after we've reconstructed is we look at things and feel things out, and we recognize that that new construction, which once was so helpful, now over time and experience and research, et cetera, learning, maturing, et cetera, we find out that we need to take another look at that construction, deconstruct it a little bit more to reconstruct, and we know the cycle is just going to continue and continue and continue. 
This happens in theology. This happens in cosmology, the way we think about the world. This happens in our relationships. So if you've been in a romantic relationship, there are different phases. You don't always stay in that early, you know, uh, phase of romantic relationship. It shifts over time as you mature, as you get to know each other. If kids get into the mix, that's a game changer, and you're having to deconstruct and reconstruct while you're figuring that out. I usually laugh out loud at parents who are about to give birth to a child who think they know what's ahead. Am I right? You have no idea. <laughs> and now you do. And now you're stuck with this for the next 18 years. But it's a delight, I promise. <laughs> it actually is a delight. So anyway, um, but you're in that phase for a while, but then the kids uh, grow up and they mature and they move on into their lives. And that's another opportunity to deconstruct, to reconstruct into a new reality, which will then eventually need to re deconstruct and reconstruct all over again. You see what I'm saying? This is everywhere. It's all over the place, the perennial tradition. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about today. And I'm going to get a little bit self-reflective with you and talk about uh, my process in understanding the Christmas story, the birth narrative of Jesus, and how I've, I've kind of worked through these things as I've learned, as I've researched, uh, gone through my own experiences and all that. And I'll say again, you do not have to agree with me on this stuff. If you are happy with the construct that you have and it's working for you, and my working de definition of if it's working for you is, if you're becoming more and more loving, if you're, that, would, that would be very Jesus-like. If you're becoming more graceful in your life toward other people, then I would say it's working for you because that is the goal, is that you become more a reflection of the love of God in the world. If, however you're kind of a jerk, <laughs> and it may be related to your theology, because oftentimes it can be. Because if in our theology, if God is a jerk, generally people who believe in that God are jerks. And so it may be time for some deconstruction and some reconstruction. But if you're fine where you are and you're developing and growing, wonderful. That's exactly where I hope you'll be. But before I get into some deep weeds and theology, uh, one last thing, and this is just a little, little footnote about me, so you know who I am and remember uh, my backstory and where I'm coming from. If you didn't know, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I've been a pastor now for 27 years, almost 27 years. That's a long time. Uh, and that means, uh, because I never repeat a sermon, I always do original stuff every week because I think that's how it should be, that means I hit the books Every week, I'm praying about the text that I may have done 15 times before, but I'm praying about it in a fresh way because I want to know what does this mean for us today and for me uh, even now. So I was just doing simple math on that. And over the course of time, uh, just counting one teaching per Sunday, throw in some funerals and a few weddings here and there, and I'm pretty confident I'm over 1,500 teachings uh, over the course of my career so far. Yeah, some of those are clapworthy, but most of them are not. <laughs> but thank you, Gretchen, for, for pointing that out. So anyway, um, uh, in all those teachings, I can, I can solidly tell you uh, that the Bible is at the center of my focus on that. Uh, and unless, and I'm, I was just thinking about this, maybe a dozen times in my career, uh, maybe if I'm teaching on a different world religion or something like that, which I did many years ago, um, I might focus on that and not be terribly biblical because I'm meaning not to be for that particular day. But by and large, except for maybe 12, even if I'm doing a book study on something, it's still going to be tied in with Scripture. I'm a Bible guy. I'm a Bible nerd. And you need to know that because some people think when I say new things that don't seem like they're in line with tradition or orthodoxy, the line usually comes up, well, Pete doesn't believe the Bible. And I just want to tell you, that's hogwash. That's just not true. And if you want to do your own research, I figured you, can't, you don't have access to all 1,500 teachings, but you have access to hundreds of teachings through Crosswalk on our website. So I'll make you a deal. If you can prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that I am an unbiblical preacher by going through hundreds of teachings that I've done here at Crosswalk, I will buy you an ice cream cone at McDonald's. <laughs> There you go. High stakes. I'm willing to risk it. 
<laughs> and the other thing I want you to know as we uh, journey into this, because I'm messing with Jesus today and talking about the person of Jesus and the birth narratives and all that, I want you to know I'm a Jesus guy. Uh, I have great respect and I honor other world religions and how God might be working through them, but home for me is Jesus. Home for me is Christianity. Uh, I uh, officially devoted my life to Jesus in fourth grade and was baptized. My family raised me in this Christian tradition. I'm a, I'm a preacher's kid. I'm a, I'm a whatever a grandparent preacher kid would be. I don't know how that phrases out, but I couldn't be more steeped in this thing. And so in fourth grade, I got baptized, and it was a special moment in my life. Later on in high school, I had this experience of the Holy Spirit that was deeply profound uh, before my sophomore year in high school, and it just further impassioned me to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. I sensed a call to become a pastor the sophomore year before, uh, my, or before my sophomore year in high school, and I said yes to that. So I knew from that point on, this is where I was headed. In college, after I meandered with some adolescence, both <laughs> in maturity and other things, uh, I came back around, and another experience of the kiss of God or the presence of God just completely blew my mind and again uh, fired me up, and many since then. All of that is simply to say that I've been a Jesus guy for a very long time. Uh, I will go to my grave. Uh, proclaiming my devotion to Jesus and trying to follow in his footsteps, even if I go to the grave because I'm proclaiming Jesus. Does that make sense? So I'm willing to die for this. I've given my life to this thing. So when I talk about things that may be new information to you or a different way of thinking that may uh, be unsettling because it's unorthodox, the reason why it's unorthodox is because myself and others through research, I challenge the orthodoxy. I think there are parts of the orthodoxy that were crafted in a very particular context, and I think were too narrow, and they've abandoned some parts of Jesus that we have to respect and honor, and especially as we bring uh, our focus into this time of year. And then more recent things in just the last few hundred years, uh, where I think there were some errors made particularly in Western Christianity because of our desire to be so laser-focused and airtight because of the scientific revolution uh, that we also miss some things in our desire to confine and control the size and scope of God and Jesus. So we're going to get there. But first, I need to show some pictures just to make you jealous of where I was uh, this past week. So on the first slide, coming up, can you tell where I was earlier this week? Yeah. So this shot was taken by Lynn, my wife. She is, I think she's got a great eye uh, for photography. We have a little contest with our iPhones uh, when we go to pretty places, and she always wins. She just frames stuff well, gets stuff in well, and we're waiting for our train to take us around the world. And uh, it was time for characters to come be met. And because of COVID, they don't let uh, the characters uh, close to uh, the guests in the park. And so we got this kind of an image, which is really cool. You see the beautiful Christmas tree uh, in the background, which gets completely lit up. It's, it's stunning. Christmas is my favorite time uh, to go down there. Uh, you can see the flag there at half mast. I think that was in honor of Bob Dole uh, this past week, I think. Uh, it may have been because of the school shooting, but I think it was from Bob Dole. Not sure. Uh, and they do a great job uh, honoring veterans down there, which is which is important. And you know, every time we're there, there's a little aside, but uh, we always want to catch the flag lowering ceremony uh, because a band comes and they play through all of the songs of uh, our armed forces. And it seems like every time we're there, um, we're pretty close to a vet who comes to experience that. And sure enough, here comes this retired guy, and he's wearing a navy cap. And uh, when they're getting ready to do this, so this Navy just said, hey, thank you for your service, you know? And as soon as that Navy hymn started to play, tears just came to this guy's eyes. And it's just a beautiful thing uh, that they do. It's really touching. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's my wife's uh, photography. And the next slide shows you my expertise. So here's a, here's a picture of the Christmas tree uh, at night. <laughs> and as I was taking this picture, we were waiting around for this parade to start. My wife and my daughter just like, there's no way you can get a good shot of this Christmas tree from here. What are you, why are you wasting, you know, space on your phone with this? And, uh, and then it just kind of dawned on me that there was something, there was something about this and the, and the shots that I'm going to show you 
uh, that kind of teach its own lesson, and they're actually appropriate for today. What you see here is the glimpse of Main Street Disneyland and the, the massive Christmas tree that they have, but it's an obstructed view. There's part of the view you cannot see because it's obstructed by that tree. The, the fake tree, which is all lit up, is blocked by the living tree in the foreground. What I want to say to you, and you'll see examples of this going forward, our view is obstructed in everything. However clearly you think you see, you have an obstructed view. We all do. There's nothing you can do about it. None of us are so pure in our capacity to see that we can articulate and understand the very obstructions that are in our way that we don't even know are there as we're trying to look upon the world. It's like this picture trying to see the tree. We think we see it, but there's stuff in the way, stuff in the way of our context, our upbringing, our cosmology, our theology, the way we view the world. Everything comes into play. Our time and history, our gender, uh, our sexuality, everything comes into play and in some ways obscures the view. And yet there's another beautiful thing happening in this picture, which is actually something worth really celebrating is that while we might want to focus on the lights of the tree and on the buildings in Main Street, the reality is, is those things really aren't what the park was for. Walt Disney, when he created this park, you have no idea what it could have developed into. He made it for a very specific reason. He wanted families to be able to come and have an amazing time together. And he remembered times going to a city park uh, with his kids and had a good time, but the park was always filthy. So he pitched the idea to his wife, I want to create a park that's clean and safe and fun for families to come and just have a great time and build memories together. So what you see before you are throngs of people who are there, alive, enjoying the moment, relationships building, uh, awe happening because they're in this space and celebrating together. So while the image of the Christmas tree may be obscured. The picture is not, and the picture is reality. That while we want to focus on the inanimate thing, <laughs> which is decorated nicely, the life is actually happening all around it. The next slide, you'll see a fine picture of City Hall blocked by my daughter's head. And she was like, why are you taking a picture? And I did this because I just wanted to say my daughter's with me. And while it's fun to see City Hall, it's more fun to see my daughter and knowing that I was there with my daughter. In the next slide, you get a fine picture of the fire station uh, <laughs> across the street. Uh, above this fire station door uh, is an apartment that Walt Disney would stay in uh, with his family whenever he would uh, be at the park. But the real magic of this photo is not the fire department or the fire station or the fire truck inside. It's what's just below it. You have a dad with his newborn. The kid can only be a few months old. It was so small. And he was babying this, this baby all night long. It's beautiful. Just below on the bottom part, you can't quite see their heads, but it's an elderly couple that's sharing a seat on a scooter. They're enjoying it, maybe with their family who's there with them. I don't know. But the point is not to focus on the dead thing. The point is to see the life that's happening all around. On the next slide, we see uh, another slide. I hope you can kind of picture this. This is a popcorn cart uh, where they sell ridiculously priced uh, popcorn. Uh, $100 for a box of popcorn or something like that. But the interesting thing here with this uh, is actually the guy who's buying the popcorn. You can't make it out too good because uh, it's a dark image, but it's a dad. And dad, because uh, I saw him with his kids earlier, uh, dad is wearing a silly backpack with Mickey Mouse. And I can pretty much guarantee you that he does not wear that backpack into the office on a regular basis. So what's happening here? This is a guy who's being vulnerable enough to play play with his kids in the park while he's there. He's in the moment experiencing the life that the park was built to help facilitate. You see what I'm saying? Life was happening all around, even while these inanimate objects like popcorn were there. On the next slide, 
Uh, these are the tin soldiers. Uh, they're, they're not real tin soldiers. They're people inside costumes of tin soldiers. But they do play real trumpets, and they're amazing, and they do some uh, good choreography. But the real picture to behold is what's in the immediate foreground, the guy standing next to me with his Mickey Mouse ears on holding his toddler daughter to take it all in. That's the life that's happening while we're watching the show go by. And I think the next slide is the final slide. And here you just kind of get the full picture from the other end of the street uh, after the fireworks show is all done. And you see all these people outdoors just kind of reveling in the moment. Uh, the park was built not to be worshipped. The park was built so that people could come together and have an amazing time and build memories and build relationship together. So on the next slide, we're going to go through what I'm going to talk about today. And it's related somewhat, well, a lot, of what's on the front of your bulletin. So we're going to take a look at John's prologue, and then we're going to take a look at a hymn about Christ uh, that shows up in one of the early, well, one of Paul's letters. It wasn't an early letter. It was one of his last letters, actually, uh, to the Colossian church. But first in the prologue, um, this is poetry that's written at the very beginning of the Gospel of John. Uh, just a, a note about John versus uh, other Gospels. You have the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're, all, they're called synoptic because you can kind of see them with one eye. Uh, that's why they're called that. John is an outlier. It was written decades after the other three. John is a theological Gospel. While he talks about some things Jesus did, he organized it in, theo in a theological framework to make a point. So the, his purpose is not to offer uh, a clear, concise history as much as a theology that was prevalent around 90 AD as the church was becoming more and more Gentile and less and less Jewish. This is what he has to say, and I'll stop a couple of times. In the beginning, the word blueprint way already existed. And right away, you're going to notice that there are some extra words that you're not familiar with. Usually, we just see that word, word. In the beginning was the word, and the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. And he existed in the beginning with God. The reason why we need to add a couple words to this phrase is because word takes us in pl to places that are not altogether helpful. First, in a evangelical background kind of church like Crosswalk, or now a post-evangelical uh, church, when we hear the word, word, we think word of God. And when Christian people in an evangelical or Protestant uh, sphere think word of God, they think Bible. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking also not about Jesus here. We're talking about something that's related to Jesus, but we're not to Jesus yet. The Word is something that existed before the flesh and blood of Jesus. They're different. The Word is the animating force, if we think theologically, of God. It's part of God, but it's an agency of God. Uh, when you see Genesis 1 and the poem of creation, God speaks creation into being with a word. See what I'm saying here? So that's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about something bigger than an individual person. This word was like a blueprint. It was a way that existed before Jesus was born. The word blueprint was with God, and the word blueprint way was God. And then instead of using the pronoun for him or he, I chose love, because that's what they're trying to get at in the gospel. Uh, God is not, uh, God is more than gender neutral. God is gender inclusive in every capacity possible. Even though you see lots of male pro pronouns, that's because of when the Bible was written. And even today, we have an overwhelming number of male pronouns where we're talking generically about people, we're trying to correct that, uh, because we need to. And so this pronoun, instead of he, the appropriate word here is love. Because if we're talking about a presence of God, John himself, in a letter, is going to say God is love. Love comes from God. And so love is appropriate. Love existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through love, and nothing was created except through love. The word blueprint way gave life to everything that was created, and love's life brought light to everyone. The light, love, shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So John is telling us there's a new chapter starting in history. 
This light is coming into the world. This way, blueprint, word is coming into the world in a new way that we're going to see happen in and through Jesus. Later on, Paul writes, much later on, well, not chrono chronologically, uh, you need to know that, that Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, never met Jesus, never met the guy in the flesh. He only met this experience called Christ, this person called Christ, this spirit of God. So that's why he speaks in this way. He kind of interchanges them uh, together, which is totally fair. But he says, Christ, or love incarnate, is the visible image of the invisible God. Love existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through love, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. Love made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. This is speaking a lot about their uh, way of seeing cosmology at the time. Everything was created through love and for love. Love existed before anything else, and love holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is love's body. Love is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So love is first in everything. For in, for God in all love's fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through love, God reconciled everything to God's self. God made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of love's and Christ's emptying blood on the cross. So something big happened when this word became flesh. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And part of the question that we need to talk about today is what is so special about Jesus? Why am I still a Jesus guy after all these years? Well, I got to tell you, it's been a journey of understanding and stretching and seeing things in different ways because the perennial tradition works that way. Uh, so when I was a kid raised in church, I just took the story as it was, just like it was written. This Virgin Mary, uh, all of a sudden, is somehow impregnated by God. So we get God, man, demigod, Jesus, and didn't really even think about it, didn't question it. It was just like, well, that's what the Bible says. So I'm going to believe it because the Bible's trustworthy and true. And uh, rode with that very comfortably. There was no reason not to. Uh, just made sense to me. In college, I would hear uh, smatterings of, uh, because that's when I was first introduced to some uh, more research and what scholars were saying about the complexities of the stories that we have in the scripture. And I first heard about some challenges to that way of thinking about virgin birth and how, what do we, how, do, how do we make sense of that, both physically, literally, and theologically. And they were challenging the veracity of it, saying maybe this was a story that was made up after the fact. And where I was at that time in college, I immediately rejected their ideas because where I was at at that time in college, uh, they were challenging the Bible. And if you're challenging the Bible, which is faithful and true and inerrant and, and infallible, it can't be wrong, then if you're saying it is wrong, you must be wrong. That's how the logic works. And so I just kind of pushed it aside and said, oh, those heretics, those apostates, what do they know? I'm going to say true to the word. And I did. And I kept writing along just fine uh, until uh, later on, uh, long after seminary, and as I just, again, the way the perennial tradition works, as I research more, as I think more, uh, as the soil of my head and my life become more fertile, I start to think about things differently and start to hear the arguments in a different framework because I'm at a different space thinking about how all this works. So this is a way that I want to present to you an alternative to that orthodox way, uh, which, by the way, um, was not as early as you might think. Uh, but the idea of virgin birth actually came and became an orthodox position much, much, much after Jesus died. I mean, way later in terms of that whole doctrine. It was not original to the story. And so, uh, what I want to say about this in terms of these three concepts, let me tell you about Jesus and why I'm still with it and what I think is happening here and why Jesus is still special. Something was happening here in the world. 
uh, God was trying to break through, uh, trying to let this word uh, out so that more people would understand the presence of God. Up until the time that Jesus was born, most people really believed that the Spirit of God uh, would dwell maybe on one or two people, and that's it. It might be a king, it might be a prophet, but that's it. You had to be super, super special uh, to, to get that kind of anointing. And there were those people, again, prophets, Elijah, Elisha come to mind. And some of the things that you might expect to happen with them, Daniel comes to mind. Um, you see those things happening with those people. But then there was this dearth. There was this silence of God where apparently God wasn't showing up with anybody. The word was silent for centuries. And then something starts bubbling up. John the Baptist is born. He's smelling something in the air, probably a mixture of both what the Spirit of God is longing to do and also apocalyptic fever because Israel no longer wanted Rome uh, over there con uh, controlling them. And they absolutely were their oppressors. And so everybody wants to see God do a new thing. And, and John is sensing that God is really ready to do, like, like creation is pregnant for this thing to happen. And so John starts rallying people and just saying, hey, get your lives right. Clean up your act because I think this thing's about to happen. Align yourself with God. Uh, turn it around. Uh, re get refined. Let the Spirit of God do its thing in you so that you're ready to be present when God does God's thing. And then his distant cousin, Jesus, shows up, who's been following uh, John's uh, teaching and is resonating with it. And on this per particular day, when Jesus is in deep into adulthood, somewhere around 30 years old or so, which is old for his day, uh, he's had a whole life behind him. He's helped raise the family because he's the oldest kid and the firstborn son. Dad died some time ago, so he's in charge of making sure mom and his brothers and sisters are taken care of, but he's, he's also smelling something going on. And he goes to John's uh, teaching on the Jordan River, and John puts out the call uh, for baptism. And something inside Jesus says, I'm in and I'm ready. I want to experience what God is about to do. And something happens in that moment that John, with his own eyes, sees and hears. The Spirit of God somehow uh, anoints Jesus in a very, very powerful way that marks the beginning of something new for Jesus. Jesus goes on a hiking trip for 40 days and 40 nights to sort all this out, try and understand what is happening uh, in me. The Word is coming into my life in a new way. The Spirit of God is in me in a way that I had not entertained before or experienced before, and I'm having this experience. What do I do with it? What is it calling me to do? What, how am I supposed to make sense of this? He goes through some temptations, which help, helps delineate what he's really about and what he's really about has everything to do with the kingdom of God and very little to do with the kingdoms of this world. So a lot of the abuses that happen in the world, Jesus through that experience is saying, I want nothing to do with those kind of power plays. This isn't about me. This is about ushering in a new era, a new way of thinking about life, God, everybody. And it's not just about me. So Jesus goes back, his ministry starts and immediately, everybody recognized that something of the Spirit of God is heavily at work in Jesus. What is happening in his mind and his ability to look at Scripture that everybody thought they knew how to interpret. And now he's saying, well, wait a minute, what about this way of thinking? He's blowing minds. He's frustrating uh, the religious teachers of his time because he's saying unorthodox things. He's saying things that are making them uncomfortable because it's a new way of thinking. And it started to get him in trouble. He's speaking truth to power in Rome. And that can only happen from a Jewish peasant if something more is going on in his life than just a little chutzpah. And then the Spirit of God is doing a little bit more. Somehow, some way, uh, the Spirit of God is bringing healing to people in myriad ways. So much of the Spirit of God is flowing through Jesus. Jesus becomes this conduit, this relationship. God truly incarnate in Jesus, the Word made flesh. So much of that is happening in all of the things about Jesus that people start to say, you know, that guy's anointed. He's the anointed one among us. And they had a word for that anointed one. And that word was, Christ, Messiah in Jewish, Christ in Greek. This Jesus, the Word is made flesh, 
And he is the anointed one. And so when we see Jesus, and this is potentially very good news already, for some of you who have struggled with the idea of the virgin birth and always wondered, I just don't know how that makes sense. This is helpful because you no longer require it. Uh, two great uh, theologians, one you've probably heard of named N.T. Wright, and a guy named Marcus Borg wrote a book together called The Meaning of Jesus. And in this book, they go through seven, I think, different major issues about Jesus, and they kind of debate back and forth. N.T. Wright is probably the most prolific uh, historical theological writer of our day. Uh, Google him. I mean, he's massive. He's from the Anglican tradition, so he comes at it from an orthodoxy. But at the end of their chapter on the virgin birth, N.T. Wright himself <laughs> says, you know, if the birth narratives were never part of the story, if they didn't happen, it really wouldn't make any difference to my faith. And that's really good news because they don't have to be there. So if that is something that has always held you back uh, from really fully uh, deciding like this Jesus thing is worth considering, you're alleviated from that roadblock because there's another way to look at it. If you want to keep it, that's fine. Uh, but, but there's a good reason to look at it in a new way. Why else is Jesus special? Because the spirit thing, this, this word becoming flesh, wasn't limited to him. He wanted his disciples to experience it too. And so he tells his disciples, I want you to go into lands because I'm only one guy. I want you to go into communities and do the very same things I've been doing. And you know what happened? They went and they did the very same things that Jesus was doing. You know what that means? That means the word was becoming flesh in them too they were starting to experience what the Spirit of God was doing on their own apart from Jesus. Later on, at the end of John's Gospel, you have John's Pentecost, which is in sharp contrast uh, to the Luke-Acts Pentecost, where we have the, the holiday of Pentecost. In John's Pentecost, you just have Jesus with the disciples, the resurrected Jesus with the disciples, and he breathes on them. Breath, remember, is the same word uh, for spirit in both Hebrew and Greek. And so he's breathing on them. John has given us this image of this transaction that is happening for the sake of the disciples. Not that they didn't have it already, but now they know they have it because Jesus has left the building and now it's them. But they know the same spirit that was at work in Jesus is now fully at work in them. And so these disciples, these Jesus followers, go out into the world, now not as one person who's anointed, but many people who are experiencing the anointing of the Spirit and the animation Word of God. And amazing things are happening as they are doing that. Minds are being open. Healing is happening in different kinds of ways. Uh, the love of God becomes more and more expansive and inclusive. It is a world-changing thing that this word made flesh is not limited to Jesus, even if it started in a new way with Jesus. That's what's special. You see, it's not just one guy. It's what started in our thinking about how God interacts with humanity because we saw the word made flesh in Jesus. Does this make sense? It's a different way of thinking that is in my opinion, less problematic down the road. The other way is a little bit problematic. See, Jesus had this prayer at the end of the Gospel of John. And his prayer was uh, that to God, this is in John 17, you can read it, the whole chapter is one long prayer. And John is praying, or Jesus is praying to God, and he's praying words of protection, protect my disciples, keep them unified. But then there's a recurring theme that shows up multiple times where Jesus prays to God and says, may they be one with you as you and I are one. May we be one together. Jesus is saying to God, I want my disciples to have the same unity with you, God, as you and I have. You know what that means? That means it's possible. It means that Jesus is saying, the kind of connection I have with God is possible for you, my followers. In fact, the way you're going to cultivate your unity with God is by following from what I've learned 
my way, my ways, following in my footsteps, the way I think, the way I'm trying to, to be responsive to God and the world in my life. And they did. But if we go to the classic view, I know I'm deep weeding here a little bit, but if we go to the classic view where we basically have a demigod, that the Virgin Mary uh, is somehow impregnated by the Spirit of God, making God man that way, then the prayer of Jesus becomes very problematic. Because the only way that that prayer could be answered uh, for Jesus is if we were also born of a virgin. Because the only way you could get that close with God is if you were also born the same way. But we're not, so it couldn't be. Jesus also said to the disciples, you will do greater works than I can. And if he says to the disciples, you will do greater works than I have, that means it's possible. And in fact, it's happened. What opened up at Christmas, what, what opened up with Jesus is not that we have a new God person to, to worship because Jesus didn't want to be worshiped uh, in his flesh and blood. But what opened up in Jesus is the floodgates of the presence and understanding of God opened up. That's worth celebrating. Incarnation isn't limited to one person. The incarnate word of God is available to any who choose to open themselves up to it and follow this Jesus. We have a problem in our society uh, because of historical decisions that were made and some stickiness of things that we, we uh, suffer from Jesus allotry. Jesus allotry is uh, where we worship Jesus more than the God who Jesus worshiped. And when we do that, even though we come by it very naturally, it's very easy to do. There are radio stations that play lots of songs about worshiping Jesus, the human being, the person. But it has its limitations. We focus on the flesh and blood of Jesus, which was certainly part of the equation and required in responsiveness to God. But it's kind of like looking at those pictures in Disneyland, where we focus on the thing that really isn't the message. Because if the message is that this is now God walking around, well, what does that really do for us? What does it do for our thinking in terms of who God is? It, it means that the same old story is the same old story going forward. There's no real good news in it. It just means that we have a new lens to see this God who is just waiting to kick our butts in some way. But now we have Jesus to trust in that will cancel our sins and all this. That's not that great a news. But if the news of Jesus is, there's a possibility for us to tie into the very animating spirit of God and to be responsive to that in all of our lives, in everything we do. And when we do, we find our lives made whole and well, and we find the world following suit. And wherever we go, uh, we bring that with us, and we bring it into the world. And you know what happens when we actually live out the way of Jesus? People look at us, and they say, now that is a Christian which means little Christ, which means little anointed ones. Our vernacular <laughs> already supports what has already been there. So if you have been boxed in or feel like you have no other way out and it doesn't make sense, I have found this to be very good news. Even if it is not orthodox, it is deeply true within the early Christian movement where they recognized what was happening. They chose to follow in his footsteps and saw the very things happening in themselves that they saw in Jesus. They learned from his footsteps. They even watched him choose to suffer and die, which was another response to the spirit of God working in to say, I'm not coming into this world with a sword to kick everybody's butt. I'm choosing to subvert the authorities by giving myself a way to shine a light on the oppression. And after he died, the disciples were wondering, is it over? And then they experienced anew his life again to recognize the spirit of God is more than this life. There's more to come. And that is good news. Well, I hope you've enjoyed my meandering as much as I have today. 
And I really mean it. I don't, uh, I'm not here to sell you anything, uh, but I am here to mess with your head and get you thinking about these questions. Like, what can we learn and apply from this Jesus Christ, this Jesus, the anointed one? What does it mean for us to be one with God? Because if it's possible, if it's something prayer worthy for Jesus, it means it's possible. How then might we choose to learn from the example of Jesus to open ourselves up to the very still new thing that God is wanting to do in the world? So we'll pray together. If any of you want to chat about this, I'll hang out down here uh, for a few minutes. And maybe you've got some of your own insights or questions. Happy to hang out. Uh, but let's pray together, and then we'll close off with the Lord's Prayer. So if you don't mind closing your eyes, take a deep breath. I invite you to just uh, process a moment. Is there anything at all that has stood out to you uh, during the service that you just can't quite shake? And if it's how good the brass band was, that's fine. Uh, because there's beauty in life in that too. Is there anything popping out for you? It's troubling even. Or maybe hopeful. And as you identify that, is there anything about that particular thing that has particular relevance uh, to where you are in your life right now? Is the thing that popped up for you related to some other thing in your life? Maybe where you are in your development. And is there any nudge happening in you? I believe that God is everywhere all the time, at work, in this place, in you. I believe that God nudges us all the time if we have ears to hear. Is there any nudge happening with you about a next step, something to think about a little more, write out in your journal a little bit more, ask some questions? trusting that somehow God is in that mix. What's your response to the invitation inherent in that nudge? Are you willing to say yes to that nudge, which generally is calling us forward into something? So God, I have no idea uh, how you are at work in this place. It's different to a person, I'm sure. But I know you're at work. I know it's who you are. I know that your creative spirit is still at work, that there's more, uh, more to life than this flesh and blood and physicality. There's more happening. We sense it at times. We see it. And I believe it's you. And I believe Jesus taught us how to align ourselves uh, with that so that we might experience more of the more. And I think it's categorized and structured in the very prayer that he taught us to pray. And so we choose to pray it today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for coming today. Hope you enjoyed at least the brass. You got that going. And hope you have a great day. We'll see you next week. Thank mm -hmm. you.